Hi, and welcome everyone to the Three Principles Global Community webinar. The Three Principles Global Community, or 3PGC, is a nonprofit organization that's committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles to people throughout the world. We have with us today Ken Manning. Ken Manning, PhD, practiced as a psychologist for 20 years before switching to working in the world of business, doing executive coaching, consulting, and training in Fortune 100 companies. He started Insight Principles with his partner, Robin Charbit, 10 years ago, and they've consulted to some of the largest global companies, bringing the three principles to thousands of people. He co-wrote Invisible Power, Insight Principles at Work with Sandy Crott and Robin Charbit. Ken and Robin also founded the, the Insight Principles Institute, an organization dedicated to training and mentoring anyone wanting to bring the three principles into the world of business. Ken, thank you so much for um, coming on to the webinar today, and I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. I trust you can all hear me. Anybody trouble hearing me? No, that's good. Okay, great. So I thought, you know, there are two ways that we could do this. One is I could talk for a bit about what we do in business and how we bring the principles into businesses and then find out what else you would be interested in. Or we can just start off with questions and that, that would give me a sense of what you want to hear about. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to go either way. If you want to raise your hand, if you just want me to talk for a while, just give you context. Or raise your hand if you have a question you want to start with. And, okay. So I'll, 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 just, I'll just talk for a little bit. So our company, Insight Principles, um, what we do is we bring the principles into the corporate arena which for me is really, really fun. Um, and I thought I'd start off by telling you a story of one of our first programs. So we, uh, we were called up by this agriculture company that was owned by a larger um, conglomerate. And uh, this was towards the end of the year and they asked uh, us to help because their parent company and asked them to come up with a plan for $100 million of profit more than the company was planning on for the next year. And at the end of November, they had already had their plans baked and set. They had gotten the whole uh, leadership team together from around the world to uh, try to figure out how they were gonna come up with a plan that would go up to 700 million instead of 600 million dollars of profit. And they couldn't do it. They came up with 30 million dollars of ideas. And in the business world, ideas don't always translate into money. So uh, the CEO who knew my business partner called us in to work with the team to see if we could come up with uh, enough strength to meet their plan. And this was the three days uh, over the weekend before Christmas. So you can imagine we were very unpopular. But we, uh, we spent, a, a, we only had a day and a half, we only had three days. So we did it, the program faster than we usually do. We, we taught them the principles in a day and a half and uh, wonderfully, we got them pretty grounded into a very quiet space. And, they could really see the inside out nature of things. Got quiet, were very reflective and looking for insight. And uh, we then transitioned over to having them focus on their business issue. And when we did that, uh, the CFO, the chief financial officer got up and explained to everybody that it was more than $100 million of a problem, it was 170 because the currency issue globally had changed so much, their forecast was only worth 150, 300, 500, sorry, $530 million. So they had to come up with 170 million, whereas a few weeks ago, they could only come up with 30. But they were in such a quiet space and they were so connected with each other. They went to work on it 
And in a day and a half, they came up with $435 million of ideas, which really blew them away. Really was a surprise to us. Even the legal guy came up with a huge chunk of that. Very, very surprising. He was just there in order to make sure whatever they came up with was going to be in compliance. But he actually came up with about $75 million of ideas himself. So what, what we see is the power of mind coming through a clear, open mind is a really beautiful thing. And when you point that at a business challenge or really any challenge, the capacity of people to get a remarkable quality of insight is just fabulous. So we stayed with them uh, for the next year. They triaged the $435 million down to about 209. And they actually made $92 million of that money so they actually finished at 692 instead of the 700 that they were hoping for which was a huge success for them and we've done this program 85 90 times now in various companies and seen just really remarkable results i have more lots of stories like that if you'd like to hear more but what i thought i'd do uh before telling you any more stories is just sort of give you the the essence of what we try to achieve. Um, I'd say the essence of it is we just want people to realize the living nature of the intelligence that's inside of them. Not just that there's a mind or an intelligence there. We just want people to see the, the living nature of it. We want people to wake up. We want people to wake up out of their thinking and into the present moment with all of the intelligence they have available to them. For individuals within the team or when we work with individuals, we want them to wake up and realize that they're living in a world of thinking. And then when people wake up, they don't take their the thoughts that are passing through their mind so seriously, which enables them to be much more open and much more present. And when we do this with teams, we're always looking for that place where they drop. You know, there's always a, an element of um, reasoning and intellect and conversation and uh, wrestling with the ideas of the principles whenever we work with a team. And there's a certain point where a group will drop and they'll, they'll start having insights and they'll start seeing those insights from each other and noticing that some of the people in the room are not thinking so hard and they're starting to see things. And then other people in the room start to get the feeling of that. They start getting the spirit of not thinking so hard about things and start getting more insight. And the group drops into a place of deep quiet and connection with each other. And when that happens, there's a flow of insight and understanding that, that comes into the room that's beautiful. And, and what happens in that space is very, very rich. And this is what we're always going for with a group. Now, at a certain point, we then transition to the business topic and have them focus on a business topic. And I'll talk about that in just a minute because I'm just trying to explain the essence of what we're trying to accomplish with folks. The last thing we try to accomplish with these folks is to help them see that it's the realization of the principles that is the secret element of the process. The knowledge of the principles or the articulation of the principles or the explanation of the principles is really nice. The language around the principles is nice for the group to align around. But there's something about realizing the truth 
of how the mind works, realizing the truth of how thought is, realizing the nature of consciousness. That in the moment when you're realizing it, it wakes you up. Now, invariably in a group, <coughs> they'll start to get insights, they'll start to see it, and then they'll make up rules. Oh, this means we should be in a good state of mind all the time. Oh, this means we should listen to each other better. Oh, this means we should do X, Y, and Z during our meetings. And the mind always wants to create an object or a tool or a thing that it can hold on to. So our hardest task is towards the end of the process is to keep people realizing that it's the realizing of it in the moment that does the trick. It's the realizing that we are conscious. It's the realizing that our mind creates a sense of reality and it's happening right now. That whatever thoughts are coming into our mind are going to look like reality to us and it's happening right now. And it's the waking up to the, it's happening right now part of it that we want to keep focused, people focused on. Because when we do that, then it becomes a sustainable learning. So if you catch the spirit of what I'm saying, you know, we all, we all want to create rules. Okay, there's the three principles and they're going to save me. Or, okay, if we... If we listen really well in meetings, we'll all be fine. But that's just the mind trying to make a form out of something that's formless. And when people realize something that's um, the nature of learning and the nature of how things actually are in the living nature of them, they start seeing that and talking with each other about that. We know that they'll be able to sustain us. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next thing I thought I would, would cover is the fact that most of the people that we get to work with don't want to know anything about the principle. They're asked to, to be in this training program they're on a team who's got a leader who is, for some reason, thinks this is a good idea. They're in a company where there's training going on in a number of places with the principals and they've been assigned to go, they've been told to go. So 90, 95% of the people who come to our programs, they could care less about the principals. And most of them are not trying to improve themselves. And Besides the few that might be interested in improving themselves, they're not interested in psychology or the human dimension. I say somewhere between 5 and 15% of any group are actually really interested in what we're teaching. So over the last 15 years I've been doing this, we've probably taught seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people. And I'd probably say 90, 95% of them were not interested. So in my first years of doing this, it was a real challenge to figure out, well, how are we going to do this effectively and gracefully and respectfully? And that was, that was a, quite a challenge. So what I say is um, where we've landed in teaching people who are not that interested in looking in this direction. Is there are a few basic attitudes or orientations that we have that we find are really important. And the first is that it's important to just be in service to our clients for what it is that they want to accomplish. So in their businesses, we want to help them be successful, whatever that means to them, whether it means having a better team or $100 million of more profit or better customers or more market share or whatever it is. We're, we're there to serve them 
in what they feel is important. And we usually align with them around their business challenges. And we commit to them to work with them to achieve their business results. The second uh, orientation is that we're dealing with really smart people. And these people are very proud of their mental skills and abilities. And once we engage with them, we find that they want to reason through whatever it is that we're speaking with them about. Now, if we had people in the corporate environment who were willing to go on a, a journey with us and put their intelligence aside and just hear what we had to say, and we're good spirited about it. Uh, the training would be a lot shorter. But that's not what we get. We get people who are skeptical, cynical, bored, not wanting to be there, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we find that we have to engage their reasoning ability and their intelligence and slowly build bridges for them over to the human dimension over to the nature of how the mind works and over to the living spiritual nature of the human process. And that bridge, bridge building is um, an art. You know, I'd say that of all of the things I'm proudest of, it's my art of doing that with people on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, that's the big challenge. Respecting their mind as they are proud of it and helping them find a way over to the principles. Um, so that's the challenge. Um, now, there's a third besides being in service and being engaged with them in their reasoning powers. There's a third orientation that I find really valuable. And that is uh, to assume that people already know the principles. I remember Sidney Banks said, we're all enlightened, we've just forgotten. So I noticed that when I am looking at people as though they're already enlightened, I have a lot more fun helping them remember that they already know the principles. When I forget that, I get arrogant and pompous and pedantic and patronizing and all of the things that I inherited from my background because I think I know better than someone else the truth of, of the matter. So I've, I've learned that, it, that, that being that way is not very much fun, but to, to uh, engage people and tease out their memories and their insights and the way that they understand life and help them separate the truth of what works from the illusion of the way things are is a really nice way to go about it and people really appreciate it we don't get much resistance from people anymore because we're really uh, committed to helping them realize something that they know from the inside out or that they can discover for themselves from the inside so that orientation I find has, has been very successful and has greased the wheels quite a bit for how we actually approach people. So I'll give you uh, the bare bones of what we actually do. Okay, so we'll meet a business leader who's got a business problem or they've heard about us and they wanna bring us in. And we'll spend a good amount of time finding out about their business and what their business challenges are. And see if they're on board with uh, learning about the principles as a component for helping them solve their business problems. And then once we get some agreement that we're going to come in and help the uh, company or a team solve a business problem, uh, we will uh, uh, decide who's all going to be on the, the team, who are all the stakeholders that are going to be in the process. And then we go and meet them all. 
and we meet them all one-on-one -on -one, uh, because we want to get a sense of you know how are, how how are they you know how embedded in their thinking are they how how easy are they to wake up to things how easy are they to talk about the human dimension or spiritual principles um, and find out what from them what how much they know about the business problem that we're trying to solve so we meet everybody individually then we get back with the leader and we explain to the leader what we found out, what we've heard, you know, what are the various opinions about the business problem, and what do we think are going to be the various challenges uh, in teaching people about the human dimension. Then we plan out what's next, which is usually a four day retreat, and uh, do it off site with everybody involved. And we then get everyone uh, at an offsite, and for two days we teach them the principles. Or more accurately, we help them remember that they understand the principles from the inside out, and help them understand the uh, illusion that we're caught up in most of the time that keeps us from being awake and seeing the truth of things. And once we get the group settled, as I described earlier, we then um, gradually bring in the business problem that the team wants to focus on in a way that's graceful enough so that they don't lose what they've learned from the principles. And then we keep guiding them to stay grounded with the principles in the moment, in real time, as they work on the business problem. And over those next two days, it's amazing how much insight and cohesion they create amongst themselves for solving the problem. And it's usually an order of magnitude or two beyond what they thought they could do on their own. All the while, while we're doing this process, we're trying to help them stay awake to the fact that it's seeing the nature of the principles in real time in the present moment. That is the power for keeping them connected to each other, connected to themselves, and getting a great flow of insight. Okay. So, um, just a couple of other things. We then we then do a lot of follow up individually and collectively. We'll go back to meetings that they're having, or do lots of individual follow up meetings to keep the learning and the uh, grounding going. And the other thing is that uh, because uh, we, we have to deal with their reasoning power a lot, we've created a lot of really fun exercises that we do with the group to help them uh, reason through the principles and see it for themselves and see each other having insights. And we have a lot of fun with that. So that's just a little bit of an orientation to what we do. Um, I can tell you lots more stories. You can ask me for a story or two about a different type of group or industry. We've done quite a few. But uh, let me turn it over to you all now. I've been talking for 20 minutes or so. So let me, let me ask you all what, uh, what makes sense out of what I just said or any questions you have or comments or anything else you'd like me to talk about. So anybody. If you have anything to say, you can unmute yourself by scrolling down into the lower left-hand corner. Good morning from Los Angeles. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, uh, as a person who has been in business for many years, uh, um, your ability to solve problems, uh, you know, with its um, outcomes is quite uh, amazing. I wanted to ask you is, I've, um, so in your presentation, you mentioned that you're given part of your discovery process is to understand or define in somewhat the problem. Um, my question is, as you guide them through the process or through these uh, several days of a retreat, uh, do you develop your own thoughts and lead them toward the solution that as you see from a business insight or basically it's more of a moderation 
and you're just there to remind them to use the principles and not lose track of that, if I may ask. Well, um, it, it often insights will occur to us that would help move the process along. Uh, we find that there are two major purposes for our programs. The first is to solve business problems, but the second is to help them become uh, more masterful on their own without us in being able to maintain their learning. So we, we orient ourselves to hang back and hope those insights that we've seen will come to the surface. Now, occasionally a group will get really stuck and uh, get all knotted up and we'll try to bring them back. Uh, and sometimes we'll have a thought or two from a consulting point of view that might help facilitate the process. So we'll throw it in there and see if it helps. But only if, it, if only if the process gets kind of bunched up. But you know, we're we're also very surprised where they end up. We don't know where they should end up most of the time, because what they're they're trying to solve is something in their business, and we don't often understand their business that well. So we don't presume to know what the right solution is, even though it temporarily looks like this might be a good idea that's occurring in our head. So we'll hang back and you know, we'll, we'll more, more than likely guide the process of getting them to reflect more or quiet down or settle down or come back to what they've learned. But we trust that the wisdom is needed within the company. It's not our job to bring wisdom to the company. It's our job to free up the wisdom that's already in the company. So Alon, am I answering your question? Very much so. And uh, um, it, it's just quite uh, enjoyable. I'm actually reading your book right now and uh, um, very enjoyable. Thank you for sharing all that you do. Yeah, you're welcome. We we went to a brings to a story to my we went to a, a medical uh, equipment company. It's a hundred billion dollar company, and they had they were changing the business processes of one of their divisions. And they had a company called AT Carney, which is a consulting company, came in there, and they did an eight million dollar project of assessing their business processes, organizational structure, and how to change them all to get to the new place they wanted to get to. And they created this book that was about this thick, you know, eight and a half by 11, about this thick, with a report out on their $8 million consulting process. And when we came in there, the, the group was all bunched up and exhausted from having gone through the consulting process. And I asked them, well, so are you using the, this book? They said, no, it's too complicated. So I said, well, would you like us to, you know, help, help you out? They said, sure. So we got the leadership team together and we just ran them through a, uh, a one day process of reflecting and getting their own insights. And within a few days, they came up with most of the stuff that was in the book from their own insights for, you know, less than 1% of what it cost them at, at AT Carney. It was amazing. We see this all, all the time. You bring in a big consulting company and they tell you what should happen. And a lot of times it's really, really helpful. But a lot of times, you know, if you, if you knew that you had all this wisdom and intelligence in you in the company, uh, and knew how to access it. I mean, that's, that's, that's worth gold. So. Yeah. yeah and I think, it. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Alan. I think your process uh, really takes uh, this idea of learning the problem one step forward because then they own it and they come up with it on their own, uh, which is very different than a consultant figuring out academically or what have you some, uh, something that they conjured up and then leaving it and saying good luck. 
So, yeah, if you're a business leader and you see that a whole section of your business is no longer needed and you have the insight for yourself, wow, I'm going to have to let go of all of these people because this doesn't fit our business anymore. That's real different than someone telling you, you need to fire all these people because they don't fit your business anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different ballgame if you see it for yourself. So we trust that, you know, people have all the wisdom they need to see what they need to see for themselves. They just don't know how to get to it. Beautiful. So there's a note here from Jason. I can't quite read it though. I can, I can read it for you. you okay. Like. This Ken, I'm intrigued with your mention of exercises that use their analytical minds to see the logic of the principles. Can you give us more of a flavor for what this looks like? Thanks. Yeah, so we're, we're, always, ex we're always innovating and coming up with new ideas for what we can actually do that would be fun and occupy people. Because, you know, people in business, particularly people in business who don't want to learn about this, their minds are full of things and they're really busy. They got busy minds, they're into their thinking, they don't want to stop their thinking. So how do you get their attention? So, um, you know, one of the things we do is we ask them right at the beginning to think of a time when they were at peace. And then to think about what were the qualities that happened in themselves when they were at peace. So people come up with things like clear or balanced or happy or uh, at one with the universe or, you know, different things. <coughs> and then we ask them, well, where do those qualities come from? And they don't have a good answer. But, it's a, but they can see that there's something natural that happens in them when they're at peace. Well, this is one way to get a group of people to begin thinking about mind. You know, we're, you know, how much intelligence is there in life that's actually operating inside of us that we're, that we're not paying attention to? Or we'll show a group of peop people uh, a picture, a still picture. And we'll ask them to tell us what happened before what's happening now, and what's going to happen next. And write down, write it all down. So people have written down a whole story. They had a past, the present, and the future. And then we'll have them get together and read the stories to each other. It's amazing that people are amazed that they came up with different stories. So you can see, you know, it's a, it's a great way to talk about thought or it's a great way to point out that we have separate realities or, or whatever you want to do with it. Or we'll have a group of people uh, sit and talk to each other for five minutes. But the person listening can't say anything for five minutes. So you have to talk about a place that you like to visit for five minutes. That's a long time, right? But the purpose of the exercise is for the listener to notice what goes on in their head for five minutes. It's amazing that people have no idea how much is going on in their head in the space of five minutes. They're all over here, they're all over there, they're making up stories about what they're hearing, they're not listening, they're, they're judging, they're waiting to talk. I mean, so it, it helps people start to see that they are thinkers. Right. So these are just a few of the things we do. We, we, we keep making them up. We just have fun making these things up. And we, you know, depending on the group or what we get moved to do, we'll make up something that points them towards thought or recognizing thought or consciousness or the intelligence in life. So this is kind of how we go about it. 
So we do lots of those very concrete things and then we debrief them. And the people go, oh my God, I'm thinking all the time, aren't I? They go, oh my God, I was having my movie in my head and I wasn't actually hearing what you were telling me. Or, oh, I had no idea that people see the world in a different way. Well, how could that be? Isn't my version right? Well, why does my version seem so right? Well, let us explain the principle so you can see why your version seems so right to you. We just have a lot of fun with that. All right, so any other any other questions? Anything else you'd like to hear about? Hi. Am I am I I can hear you. Okay. Um I'm sorry that I came in late. I messed up my calendar today. Um so you said something about um that when you get together with the individual players that you kind of talk to them and get a sense of their openness to spirituality or new ideas what kinds of things do you do or how do you but what kind of language do you use because that's a stumper for me sometimes well we'll uh we'll tell people that what we do is we teach people about how the mind works and then we'll say do you have any interest in that topic And they'll usually say yes or no. If they say yes, we ask, well, you know, do you have any background in studying how the mind works, psychology, human development, leadership development? And they'll say, a, you know, a sentence or two, and then we'll, we'll build from there. So we'll say, okay, so, so you've taken some leadership courses. Were there any that you liked? Well, yeah, I like the Myers-Briggs. Well, what did you like about the Myers-Briggs? Well, I liked learning that I'm, I'm uh, introverted and other people are not. Oh, okay. Well, does anything else interest you about what makes people tick? Well, no, not really. So we'll, we'll go down a, you know, a, a series of questions narrowing in on the field to find out where they are. And then, uh, if we get to a place where they say they're not that interested, then we look for something that they are interested in. Like, do you get along with your coworkers? No, not, not really. I don't like most of them. I say, well, do they, do they annoy you? I say, oh yeah, they annoy me all the time. I say, okay, well, you know, you can't really change other people that much. They say, yeah, yeah, I've noticed that. So then we'll say something like, well, even though you can't uh, change people, would you like to know how to be less annoyed? And I'll go, that's not possible. I say, oh, no, it is, I say, it's actually possible. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll tell them personally, I'm a lot less annoyed than I used to be because I learned well, because I learned this. So you would actually have less suffering in your life or less bother in your life if you could learn how to not be annoyed by other people. Would you like that? Oh yeah, I really like that. Um, so then we say, well, um, we're gonna, we'd love to share with you some things that we've learned about how the mind works so that you can see how to not be annoyed with people. Oh yeah, I'd love that, that would be great. Now, some people have a spiritual background. I mean, we, we're in a lot of technology and science companies. They've got a lot of people from India who have this incredibly deep, rich, spiritual Hindu background, which is way beyond uh, a simple understanding of the principles. And uh, so we'll talk to them about that. You know, what's your background? What have you studied? You know, who's your guru? You know, what, what have you learned about the nature of with the spiritual dimension. And sometimes people will, will talk for half an hour about what they they grew up learning as a child in India or in their church or in their temple or somewhere else. So well, then we'll say, well, you know, we'd love to take all of that and make that practical in a business setting. 
and then there's everything in between. But we keep it at a very ordinary language. And sometimes we use the spiritual, the S word, and sometimes we don't. But it just depends on, you know, what the rapport is with the person that we're talking to. We just try to make it really ordinary. Because it is really ordinary. You can make it woo woo, but you don't need to. Does that answer your question, Martha? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> well, what else would be helpful? I can't hear you. I see that you're leaning forward to talk, but I don't hear you. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I've got a question about um, a lot of the principles, um, stuff that I hear, the, the books that I read, it gets very personal very quickly. Um, so we get into what's really going on in our heads. And I wondered, um, in my experience of working in corporates and businesses, people keep themselves to themselves a lot. So I just wondered how you get around having these very personal conversations with people that have maybe been forced to work in a team together, um, don't, don't, not really used to sharing their, their personal stuff with other people. Does that become an issue? How do you get around that? Oh, that's a great question. There's actually nothing personal about the principles. <laughs> Unless you think there is. And a lot of people think there is, so for them there is. But there's actually nothing personal about the principles. The principles just are. And um, uh, we don't see it's our job to do therapy with our business clients. So we just explain to them, we're going to explain to them how the mind works. This is education. This is basic 101. It's like if you're going to drive a car, it's good to know how the car works. If you're going to use a power tool, it's good to understand how the power tool works. Well, this is quite a, quite a uh, tool we've got here, this human mind. So we just want you to know how it works. And uh, during the process, we're going to have you use your own observations of yourself as your data for what we're talking about. But we tell them this is not about personal transformation unless you want it to be we just want you to understand how this beautiful thing works so that you can use it uh, more effectively with yourself and with each other and then we ask people uh, at the beginning of our program to have some skin in the game and we want everybody to come up with a miracle that they would like to have for themselves as part of our programs. And we want them to then uh, think about it, write it down, share it with another person, and then speak about it to the whole group. So we have everybody share something that they want. We tell people, look, you know, the range of things is whatever you want. I don't sleep very well at night. Um, I don't like dealing with difficult people. Um, my wife is depressed or my husband is anxious or you know i have teenagers i have no idea how to communicate with my teenagers whatever you want a miracle about we want you to think about it because if you have something on your mind like that it will help the learning go much deeper but you're not required to have anything in specific or you're not even required to have to share it with a group but most everybody does and then they, they all say listen i worry too much or i'd love to trust the universe better or you know i have teenagers and they're impossible or you know i can't sleep or you know we, we hear everything and we write it all down and we put the flip chart of all these 25 or 40 issues on the wall and then we never go back to it it's just there and then we just talk about the principles and how the mind works and oriented towards um, insight and being present and awake and connected with each other. And if they want to bring up the insights they're having about their own personal things, they do that, but we don't focus on that. So it's personal as much as people want it to be, but we don't orient it there. Okay. 
Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And it actually, I find it actually makes the learning go deeper faster. Because when you're, when you're working on personal things and trying to learn the principles at the same time, you can't help but apply what you're learning to your problem too soon before you've actually seen the principles deeper, more deeply for yourself. So we find that you know, getting people to really learn the principles without focusing on themselves is, a, is actually an intelligent strategy. That answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thanks very much. You're, you're welcome, Libby. You're welcome. Okay, anything else? Again. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. What's your uh, name? Alan. Alan. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. It's really, uh, there's a simplicity to what you're saying and that's very helpful to me uh, that I'm getting. Um, so what's occurring to me is um, when you say teach the principles, I guess, uh, are you do, you, do you talk about uh, Sid Banks? Do you talk about mind consciousness and thought? Or is it more just sort of pointing to those things? Or is it just what, what occurs to you uh, with each group? Um, that's a good question. Um, we seem to go in waves of talking about the mind, about mind consciousness and thought, and then waves of not talking about mind consciousness and thought. And I don't know why that is, but I just noticed we go through these waves of it. Um, there are two main points we want to get across. Uh, the first is that we're living from the inside out and the way that reality looks to us is created in our mind. And the second thing we want people to realize is that we're designed for success and the only thing we can do is screw it up. And business groups can really rally around those two main points in a really big way. Um, I like, I love teaching mind consciousness and thought. I think they're incredibly useful. Um, but it's not what people usually hang on to. They usually hang on to something else. So we, we like to summarize the, as the primary implications of the principles, the fact that we're living in an, in an illusion and don't realize it. But if you wake up to that, you become a free person. And the second is if you get out of your own way, there'll be more than ample resources, energy and intelligence available to you, inside you, if you, look and people really love to grab onto those two points so um i like to talk i like to talk about consciousness i like to orient people towards the nature of consciousness i find it settles people down i love to talk about thought because it's the invisible power that we're using all the time. And I like to talk about the innate intelligence in life and the spiritual intelligence in life, but I always use different language because I, I begin to go in the direction of that in the group and I wait for someone in the group to put a name to it. And then I try to go with their, their group's language. I don't want to impose any language. So my, I, I don't, I, I've never liked the term mind for what Sid Banks is pointing to as mind except in the Buddhist version of big mind. But from a non-dual point of view, there is no other mind. There's just one mind. So Sid calls it mind, except the problem is in English, in America, where I teach most of the time, mind is associated with psychology. 
and it means a lot of different things to different people. So as a word, I find it tricky to use, especially in the business environment. So I don't use, I don't often use the term mind, except I know that a lot of people who are going to be reading Sid Bank's books are going to be exposed to it. So then I will tell them in advance, this is what Sid is pointing to when he uses the term mind, we just use a different term. But thought and consciousness we'll talk about all the time. But then again, it goes in waves. And, you know, sometimes I feel like talking about it and sometimes I don't. As a formal way of presenting. But they're all, it's all, it's, it's all, first of all, it's all there is. So you can't not talk about it. But whether you talk about it as a conceptual framework or not, that's a different story. Did I answer your question, Alan? Yeah, I think so. I mean, what I'm hearing is it's sort of whatever makes sense for the group um, in that moment, I, I suppose. Yeah, we're watching for the group to wake up to the nature of things. Mm -hmm. And if we could do it in Swahili and that's what the group needed, we'd do it in Swahili. Right. Uh, and so, so this is sort of veering off of that now. I mean, staying on it, but probably getting away from, from the answer. But uh, do you talk about Sid's experience or anything like that or, or Sid at all? Or is it more, again, just thought, consciousness, what, what appeals to that group in that moment? I rarely will talk about Sid and his experience. Sure. You know, as a, as a uh, trainer, what I discovered at a certain point is that unless something looks absolutely true and alive to you in the moment, you shouldn't talk about it. Yeah. So I only talk about consciousness when I'm actually seeing, feeling, knowing the aliveness of what I'm talking about, about consciousness in the moment. Now, I, I didn't have Sid's experience, so I have no idea what really, I mean, I have what he told us, but I don't really know what he experienced. If I had, if I had the experience, I'd, I'd tell people about my experience. But I don't, I've never really seen it that useful to talk about Sid's experience. Unless I thought it was in service of giving people the awareness that there's a lot more to be discovered than what we what we know in the moment. I mean, his experience was so out of the ordinary for such an ordinary guy to have that experience. It speaks to the potential for all of us to have all kinds of things occur to us that we're not expecting at any time. So that's the only reason I would bring it up, but I don't talk much about it because I don't really know what he experienced. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So two questions were typed into the chat. I'm gonna ask the second one first because um, Martha was asking when you were talking about uh, mind not and not liking the, the word mind she um, asked then what word do you prefer uh, okay. I try not to use a word but I'll refer to the intelligence of life or the or life force or Sometimes God comes in because there's spiritual people in the room and they say, oh, are you talking about God? I say, yeah, we're talking about God. Or, um, I like to point to the living nature, the aliveness of mind. You know, in the Hindu tradition, they talk about Sat Chit Ananda, the ever-existing, ever-conscious joy of consciousness. I mean, I, you know, there's, I try to, I try to get people to sit back and relax into the living nature of it. 
So when we get to that part of our program, that's what we're going for. We're not, we're wanting to get people away from a form that they can, that their mind can grab onto and say, oh, okay, I know what this is now. We want people to relax out of the intellectual forming process and relax into the living soup and swim around in it for a while. That's why we try to avoid naming it. Yeah. And Libby asked a question. Um, she is asking, when you work one-on-one -on -one with individuals at the beginning of a program, do you work with your partners together and one person or literally one-on-one, -on -one, you and someone else or Robin and someone else? Oh, it's all, it's, it's, uh, it varies. You know, it's, you know we'll, we'll sometimes work with a leader and have them come do a four-day retreat with us to get them really grounded to see what it is that they're putting their team through. And we really like it when that happens. So sometimes uh, we'll, Robin and I will both be in the room with that person some of the time. Uh, or sometimes uh, one of us will just do it alone. And then when we're doing our orientation sessions with a team program for individuals, and we're gonna see a team and we see all the individuals in advance separately. Sometimes we'll do them together, sometimes we'll do them separate. It depends on what we have time for. And it depends on how much, how strategic it is for both, us both to know the person really well. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Okay, well this has been really fun. Nice to meet you all. If you have another minute, I, I something popped in my head to ask you. Yeah, sure. I have lots of time. I'm just curious if you might have a story about maybe a particularly difficult group to turn around um, or to work with and, and what you might have done in a situation where people just didn't want to be there. I mean, having, having worked many for many years in corporate america i can remember just being at meetings where nobody wanted to be there nobody wanted to participate we were mandated and nobody was listening and i'm, I'm just curious if you if you have that situation and what you might have done to to really sort of stir things up and get it moving well uh we had a few of those types of groups at the beginning of our working in business and then realized we never wanted to have that experience again which is why we created the process the way we do which is to meet the leaders first get their buy-in have them message it out really well and then go and meet with everybody individually find out sincerely where they are and how they relate to what we're going to be doing and then work with them to orient them to the process so that they're on board at least a little bit and willing to listen. And if we sense that someone isn't in that uh, spirit, we ask them not to come. Or we go to the, back to the leader and tell them it's not going to be a good idea to have this person in the room. And that's happened very few times. I think maybe three or four times in the last 10 years have we had to do that. But they happen once in a while. But we do get groups that are uh, difficult for other reasons. So once we've gone through the vetting process, sometimes a group will come and they're not connected to each other, or they have had bad history, or they have attitudes, or they don't really want to work together because they're too busy. So we actually had a group like this in August. <coughs> Excuse me, we had to fly out to Phoenix to meet with 22 people. And uh, the CIO of one of the big uh, technology companies, one of the top four technology companies, 
I asked us to work with her team. We worked with her team, and then they came up with a new strategy for 20, the year 2020. And uh, they assigned 15 people below this level to make the strategy happen through 15 key initiatives. And none of these 15 owners of these key initiatives worked together. And they were all in different parts of the business. And they all had very big day jobs. And they all uh, had ways they were dependent on each other's effectiveness and deliverables in order for them to meet their deliverables. But they didn't have time to work with each other because they were so busy getting their own deliverables done in their own areas. So uh, they came together with a few of their technical leaders. So we had these 15 owners of these key initiatives. Some of them knew each other, but none of them worked together. And none of them had time to work with each other. So there wasn't a lot of uh, warmth and camaraderie in the room. But we, we went through the process and in the first couple of days, we got everybody settled down and really quiet so that they were really seeing the inside out nature of their own feelings, which helped them get into sort of a neutral place with each other. Now the culture in the company is actually decent. So they're, they're decent people. So then on the third day, we kind of asked them, okay, given what you've learned, what do you think you need to do? Um, they started to come up with a way of going over all of the information that they already had. We just kind of let them run their own process. And then they began to see after a while that this wasn't going to get them anywhere. But they were settled and they were connecting. They were respectful. They were starting to learn how to communicate with each other. They were learning from each other. But no, there was no leadership in the room. There were no leaders. I mean, they were all leaders, but there was no leader of this group in the room. And uh, about two thirds of the way through the third day, they realize, oh, we're not going to get anywhere doing this. And we have a big job to do because it's our job to carry out the 2020 strategy for all 110,000 people in this company. We have to own this thing. How are we going to own this thing? And then people started to come up. The natural leadership and some people started to come out. So the group started to have some natural leaders come out. And then between then and the end of the fourth day, they realized that they had to not only own this thing, but they had to relieve their bosses of being involved. And they came up with a strategy on how to, how to take ownership of the whole thing, relieve their bosses and become a very tight working team. Now that wasn't what we had come together to accomplish. We had come together to accomplish. How are we going to accomplish the 2020 strategy in 2019. That was what this group was tasked to do. They were not tasked to take it off their boss's hands and become a tight team. But they realized in order to be successful, they had to. And they got really excited about it. So the learning curve was kind of like this. It was really flat for a long time. And then they realized, oh, we got to own this thing. Let's do it. And by the end of the meeting, they came up with a plan to relieve their bosses of the 2020 strategy, how to, how to actually operate as a high functioning team together and how to get it done by the end of 2018. Cause they realized they actually have to get it done by the end of 2018 because the speed at which the industry is accelerating. If they don't get this done by 2018, they're going to get left behind. And they they missed them. They missed the whole mobile computing technology opportunity of the '90s and the 2000s. And they weren't going. They're not going to miss the next one, which is the Internet of all things. So they realized they've got to get this done by 20. And they got totally inspired. Now, we were dumbstruck. We had no idea this was going to happen. 
but they were thrilled. And then when their bosses found out, they were thrilled because they had so much other things to do. They were glad to hand this thing over. So, so we see this all the time. People, people who are even on the same team for years and years and years and years, they'll say to us at the end of the program, "We've been working together for 25 years, but we didn't. We had no idea. We we came to know each other so much better than we ever have known each other through these few days." It's really beautiful. Well, anyway, that's a little bit about what we do. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, anyone else have a question or comment for Ken? No? Okay. Well, thanks so much, Ken. This was really a great talk. I really appreciate it. And I just want to remind everyone, uh, the next one is going to be December 14th with Lynn McBride. So I um, hope to see you all then. Thanks. Again. Right, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.